I've learned to walk in a place <clears throat> I've learned to walk in a place that is a secret place <clears throat> when we took the little trip down to Florida here a while back in the conference that I was in I told my wife I, I just want to go back to my room uh, yeah we were experiencing some sickness but I just said I'd Let's, I just want to go back to my study, to my prayer room where I spent so much time. And that has become a little haven for me. And somehow, if I could allow that little room to be around me at this time as I speak to you, uh, so that you might have what you desire in Christ. There's so many people that I believe do not desire a deeper life, but I know that's not your desire. I know that most of you, perhaps all of you, desire a deeper life and a genuine life. And my prayer is just so that it would go out into your lives and that God could do a marvelous thing in you, that which you've been asking, victories that you've been calling on God for, other kinds of things in your life, blessing where God's blessing perhaps is not resting on you and you're seeking his blessing. If God could perhaps bring you to a place where he answers his prayer in the garden and the high priestly prayer, if that could somehow be upon you today. And like I say, I don't know that the message is anything. Uh, the me message is perhaps nothing really you're looking for. But I understand that it's in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. It's not necessarily in it's not in the wisdom of words, but it's in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. It's where God changes things within us. I'm not sad as I stand before you, even though I have tears. I'm not sad. If I could just <clears throat> relate something to you, I don't want one step in my life to miss what God wants. I have surrendered my life. I have died many deaths. And I've surrendered my life to do exactly what God wants me to do and to never waste time in whatever I'm doing, whether it's behind the pulpit, whether it's coming into the presence of you people unprepared, I don't ever want to come into your presence not being prepared. What God says and what God is saying at that moment, it's not that I'm somebody great, but I'm a servant, and I need and I depend on God completely all the time for everything that he wants me to walk in. And so I just pray that today, uh, I know we have a brother over here that has cancer, and uh, I pray that today that as we're speaking, that cancer would start going away, that he would be healed by the power of God. Because there's, pe there's people that get healed in these services. I'm aware of that. We have testimonies of it. And if God can do healing, it's not limited to how big and how small, because it's in him. And there's others of you that are sitting here that have been praying to God perhaps during the week, God, give me something for Sunday morning that fits my need. And so I stand before you, and like I say, I'm not sure how, uh, how far I will go in this message, but I would like to start in continuation of the series that I've been doing on glimpses from the garden, the Garden of Eden. And today I would like to speak on two trees in the midst. <clears throat> Two trees in the midst of the garden. Father, help me that I can keep my thoughts together as I go through this now. As I lay before you, Father, as we present our bodies a living sacrifice to you, whether in the pew or whether in the pulpit, we come prepared and we ask you to change us, Lord, remake us, Lord. Join us to the image of your Son. Yes, Lord. I'm also aware that these messages go out in places. They're begging for these messages in places. I'm aware that even as far as in persecuted Muslim countries, they're watching these messages. 
And my heart goes out to people like this tremendously, where they threaten the life. I've had several death threats on my own life, and I know what that is. But my heart goes out to people like that. There's people that are waiting till they come home from their service today to listen to this message. I know that. People that are yearning and people that are crying out for greater revival. And I believe it's in our hands. It's in our hands. So I tremble before you as I turn to Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. <clears throat> but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel that was preached of me is not after man. Verse 12. For neither received it, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I just want to make note of this. The beginning of the, sur uh, the, beginning of the message is the two trees in the midst, and it's referring to true two trees in the midst of the garden. This is where God started with man. This is the place, this was the beginning moments that God made history inscribed in his first dealings and first moments with mankind. He put him in the garden. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now we want to also look at the first moments that Paul had when he came to Christ is the verse that I read, verse 12 especially, I would like to read again. For I neither received it of man, I did not receive the gospel of man, neither was I taught it, but by the, by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul said that I was not taught the gospel, I didn't receive it of man, but the gospel came to me by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, and it says here, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Notice it says in the knowledge of him. It doesn't say of the knowledge of him. I don't know. I don't know why I can't stop crying this morning. I've been weeping for so long. We notice in this verse it says <clears throat> that he has given him, that may, God may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, not of the knowledge of him. And in this I want to lay the foundation, in this I want to lay the foundation of what the Garden of Eden was when the trees were in the middle of the garden. It says that Paul says here that he received wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, not of the knowledge of Christ. And I believe in these two truths is the whole difference between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. When we walk in the Spirit, we want to receive revelation of the knowledge of Him. When we walk in the Spirit, we receive revelation in the knowledge of him. There's a difference of understanding. And what I'm referring to today is many people, uh, like I've told you before, there's many people that see through the threshold into the other room that is deeper in the Christian walk, but they only see through it, never walk through the threshold of it. And therefore, it's easy to speak about it, and yet to experience it is another thing. And what this is saying, what Paul is saying is here, He's saying that he has received wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, not of the knowledge of Christ. And my prayer is so deeply that as I speak to you today, that you would not receive knowledge of him, but in him. There's a complete different story. To one is by way of knowledge, which was the very knowledge that Adam and Eve ate off of the tree. They picked off of the tree and they picked knowledge off of that tree. 
But the knowledge that God has given was to be in him and to receive it by way of a relationship, not by way of a book. You understand what I'm saying? In this, I want to turn then to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 3, and it says, But of the spirit of the tree, I'm sorry, but of the fruit of the, of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, now we're talking about the garden of Eden, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. There's two things that God had asked Adam and Eve not to do. One of them was, do not eat. Another one was, do not touch. Now we look at verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now let's just go back to that verse again and scan down through it again. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree. Notice he made every tree grow out of the ground. Every tree includes the tree of life. Every tree was made to grow out of the garden. That is pleasant to the sight. They were all pleasant to the sight. Every last one of them. And they were all good for food. Even including the tree of the knowledge, obviously. It was good for food, but it was forbidden. And then it says, of the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The word knowledge means cunning and craftiness. When I look at what Eve did, she looked at the garden, she thought, or I looked at the tree, and she looked at the tree and she thought, if I would pick off of that tree, I would gain cunningness, and I would gain craftiness. I would gain understanding of something that I don't have to experience, but on here, on up. I can get of this fruit, and it can educate my head, and yet my heart doesn't have to change. Do you see this? And God said, I cannot have you walk even in the garden from this point on. If you lean on your own understanding, if you lean on your own power of knowledge to take off of my tree and to take that and eat it, and what was on there was good and, good and evil. It was the knowledge of the good and the evil. And God said, I cannot have you eat off of my tree if you eat off of that tree. And this is where I'm, I'm so deeply moved at this. I'm sorry to tell you this, but most Christian know today lives off the tree of knowledge. Having no deep understanding of who Christ is, but rather under the knowledge of eating and participating in that which changes up here and not in here. This is what happened with Eve. She wanted something that would change her thinking, not her heart. God spoke very clearly. And he said, do not eat of that tree, because if you eat of that tree, you'll become as gods. And then Satan later on, through the form of the serpent, also spoke to Eve and said, has God said, you may not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He said, he knows that if you eat, you're going to become as gods. Later on, you read that God is saying that lest they become like gods now to know good and evil, they have become like gods, but now, lest they become and live forever, it says, take them out and make so that they cannot eat life. You see, you cannot have knowledge off of the tree and life in the same garden. And that's what most people desire, a deeper knowledge, a deeper understanding of something that changes my head and gives me a deeper purpose of my self-life rather than something that I get by way of in relationship with Jesus. You see, what Eve tried to do obviously here was she tried to get a hold of something that she could take in without doing anything more of changing in her life. You see, the tree of life, if we look at it, the word life is actually Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I believe if we could look at it, really, it would almost appear that that tree of life might have even been Jesus, or at least a form of him. It might have been his very presence. And Adam and Eve chose not to eat of the tree of life because of the relationship that needed to be formed to have this. And that brings us back to the first verse I read. I'll read it again, or the second verse. 
Galatians chapter 1, verse 12. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. I was not taught it. I received it by revelation. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. Not of the knowledge of Christ. You see, what Eve was reaching of, she was reaching for knowledge of. Not wisdom in. Which comes by way of the tree of life. Now, I, I could spend more time on this, but I think perhaps as we go further, you will all at once make some sense out of what I'm trying to say. I noticed that every tree was pleasant to the sight and good for food. There's two special trees in that garden. One tree was life and the other was knowledge. The problem with the tree knowledge, and I should address them as the tree knowledge and the tree life, the problem with the tree knowledge, it had so many different kinds of things on it. It had everything you really wanted to make one wise. It had everything you really wanted without going through the cross of it, without having the cross like we have in our day today. It was everything that you really would desire to make you wise. It was good for food, like all the other trees. It was a desirable tree, like all the other trees. But there is one thing wrong with this tree, and that is off the same source came good and bad. And God said, you cannot have that. He did not want mankind to be polluted with the idea or to be polluted with the sin and the nature of having good and evil all within his own being. God did not want good and evil to dwell within the man. You see, within the garden was a tree, and now within man there is a tree. Because Adam and Eve ate off of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we deal with the knowledge of good and evil today in our own hearts. And this I can, I can exemplify in a little time. I will, I will get to this more clear. The aid of the tree of cunning and craftiness. Now, when you look at the word knowledge... There is numerous words interpreted knowledge in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. But the word knowledge here is the same word when we read of uh, eating of the tree of knowledge. It's the same word in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, where the Bible talks about that in the end time, knowledge shall increase. It's referring to craftiness, personal smartness, personal things to sustain us where we become so wise and so, so powerful in our own ways that we don't need the power of God. And it says that in the end time, there will be an increase of this. The same knowledge that was eaten off of the tree at the end time will, I believe, explode. And like I have told you before already, if we would take a graph and we take it from here and take it to there, and that would be from the beginning from the garden, and this would be the day we live in, we would come down with a little pointer where it, it, knowledge is basically going the same distance and the same heights on a chart until we come always over, all, all the way over to where we are today and all at once it would spike extremely high. That's how knowledge has increased. But what this is referring to, that there is another knowledge that will increase, and I believe this knowledge is that will be increasing is in the religious realm. It's in the religious world. We know more about sin. We know more about how to overcome it than we ever have. And the world is in worse shape than it's ever been. We continue on a downhill slope living on the power of knowledge. And that knowledge will increase. We'll have all the answers. All the answers that we would ever need. You can find it in bookstores. People getting wealthy on bookstores. And I'm not putting that down in any way. There's a lot of good books. I'm even writing books as I'm speaking. I'm writing books to this very day. There's a lot of good books. But what I'm saying is knowledge shall increase. People will turn to knowledge to better themselves by their own strength and by their own power, by the things that they all ate off of the tree, not by a relationship that they have with the tree of life that changes the inner man and the inner nature. And some of this comes because when we now have, as all of us are in the guilt, that have the power of that knowledge within us, so we could turn. We have the two trees right within us. Uh, Roman, uh, Romans chapter 7 talks about it. We have those two trees, and we can walk in whichever we choose. 
But now since there is that fighting going on within us, we get desperate. And when we get desperate, we become impatient. And we don't allow God to take us through the course of understanding and knowing Him by way of a deeper walk, by way of, by, by way of experiential living with Christ, but rather just the knowledge thing of Christ that we can find any little detail and all little details of little band-aids and everything that we can somehow grab to patch on to our life to make us better than going through the deep valleys and deep moments of life that God wants to lead us in to take us deeper into a full relationship with Him rather than just knowledge that comes off of a tree that is just eaten in through the mouth but that is experienced by way of a deep, deep walk Sometimes personal defeats, sometimes some very deep moments, some very deep failures can even come to bring you down, to keep you to that place where you long and you, you lean on to Christ rather than just knowing about Him where you experience him. I noticed that in the book of Revelation, it says at the end, the, they were dressed in white robes, it said. And, and one of them said, what are these that are dressed in white, white robes? And who are they? And the answer came, it was these that have gone through great tribulation and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. It's these moments that seem so defeating to us. When we cry before God, when we lay before Him, and we call on Him over our failures, over the things that have tripped us, and over the things that have discouraged us, it's at those moments when the blood of Jesus cleanses those robes. Those are the ones that are seen in heaven. God is not looking for, at your failure. He's looking at your heart. Many people make failures. I make failures. He's look, not looking at my failure. He's looking at my heart. And he knows what my heart wants. And I believe according to the Bible at the judgment seat of Christ, it will be my heart that will stand before him. This is the Christian walk. And it's the difference. It's the different choice that Adam and Eve wanted versus what was offered to all humanity. Humanity, at that point, got the option, which was really no option after the aid of the forbidden tree, that now we deal with something that was never intended for us to deal with. God never intended that we understand knowledge and evil. He just wanted us to understand good. It was the tree of life. He just wanted us to have life and be full of life and never die and never have a disease and never have sin. That's what God wanted. That's what he created. But when man chose to take his own arm out and to reach into that tree where there was a serpent hidden in it and speaking out of it that you can go this way without paying the price. You can go this way without the cost. You can go this way, which is the easy way. You can go, may I say, oh, that the Ishmael might live. That Ishmael might just live in me. That my performance could bring to me what I really want. This is what Eve and Adam reached for. And God drove them out of the garden. I see this. It must be a most frustrating life for people that only have it up here. But then down here in their private closets and when they're alone, they're completely different. They're not the same person. There's things hidden in there. There's cries, and I, I've heard those cries. I've heard your cries. I've heard your cries come out of you, that you're crying in desperate times and des desperate moments where you're seeking God and you're calling out to Him for victories that you have not experienced, that you long to have. You know, these are experienced by going through it. It's the way of the cross. It's the real life. It's where God changes you from one glory to another. It's not just the understanding that comes into the head. It's by a divine walk with God. It says the tree of knowledge, if you look at it in Greek and Hebrew, it says 
it's the cunning and craftiness. In Luke chapter 11, verse 52, woe unto you lawyers. I want you to see this. Woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You have, you entered not in yourselves, and them that were entered, ye hinder. The act of the key of knowing. And I hope there's, if there's lawyers in here, I don't know if there's lawyers in here or not. If there happens to be, I'm not against them. But I just want to show what they do. You see, when somebody gets in trouble with the law, without a lawyer knowing that person at all, he will basically tell that person what that person needs to plead. If that person just killed somebody, if I could use that as a grim example, if that person just killed somebody, the lawyer will tell that person, do not confess. That lawyer will then tell that person everything that person is to say without forming any relationship. It's all knowledge. This is what a typical lawyer will do. A lawyer, a lawyer will present you. A lawyer will speak about you. A lawyer, lawyer, a lawyer will, uh, will present you or represent you and put words in your mouth that you need to have. And then it says here in Luke chapter 11, 52, Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. The real key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering ye hindered. It's the key of knowing. You've taken away the key of knowing because you don't need to know me anymore. You can just tell me what to say. You can just tell me what to plead. I don't have to walk through the depth of finding out and knowing. This is based also on the basis where Paul said, Oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Paul said that I might know Jesus and the depth of who he was and the understanding of who he was by way of suffering, by way of understanding much deeper that it is entwined and interwoven in my physical being. He said that I might learn Jesus that way, not by way of a presentation from a lawyer where he will tell me what all to speak, where I'll use my best wisdom to say it, but by the power that gets interwoven through sometimes the horrible defeats that I make and then my sacrifice and then my confessing coming to him and being real before God in true worship and showing him and telling him my weaknesses in this he says lawyers you have kept people from entering into him You've taken away the key of it. The key is to come down and walk in humble human form. To walk where God meets us as little children. Not as somebody large. Not as somebody that knows it all. This is where God... See, this is the division between the two trees. The one tree is a tree of life. And that's the one that you'll always get life from. Tell me one person that hasn't surrendered their life to Christ and given everything to Christ and laid it upon the altar and they walk away free and they walk away full. They walk away forgiven. They walk away changed. But when I can spend hours of time and sit down with you and try to convince your mind to think different without dealing with the issue, you will not be different. This is where Adam and Eve made the difference. This is what they did. They reached onto the tree that was in the midst of the garden. What is so interesting, in the midst of the garden, it says that there were two trees. And out of the midst of it, out of the midst of the garden of Eden, yet their float was the headwaters of a gigantic fountain. It must have been a huge fountain because it fed four different rivers that are still flowing to this day. Somewhere out of the internals in which I thought about going into when the fountains of the deep broke open and the flood came when God destroyed the first uh, era of people. I thought about going into, I thought time will not allow me to do that. But if you could just see a little bit, the amount, of, a little bit of the Garden of Eden, what it looked like and the water that was flowing and how that it flowed from right out where those trees were and it watered them. It was an amazing story, I believe, what God had in the Garden of Eden. And so we get glimpses from it. We see in it, we see some things in that garden that are life-changing. And this is one of those things. You see, many, many times, my friend, you and I, 
have been spoken to by the serpent. You've been taught by the serpent out of that tree. And you've been told this is the way to go when God has given you this. But when you receive this, it's by way of an understanding in an intimate way, in a personal way, in a way that God, like I said, he intertwines it in your heart. He makes you new. He just doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't confuse you or, or he doesn't deceive you with thinking you're new. You are new. You are different. But the cost of it is what Adam and Eve did not want. I mean, what more do you want than life? When you have the promise, if you eat of this tree, you will live forever. You will never die. But even eat of this one, you're going to die. What was so deceptive that a person would choose to rather eat of this one and die than eat of this one and never die? You know, we look at Adam and Eve and we look at them and say, how could they have been so deceived? Because here they were offered eternal life, never to die, always to live, always to be happy, always full of joy and the power of God. And here, sure death. What was so attractive to this versus this? You know what it was? May I tell you, it was the cross. The cross in the life. They needed to sacrifice that personal knowledge that they so longed for. They long for that knowledge rather than the life. And friend, once you start yearning for knowledge more than life, you're in trouble. You'll get pushed out of the garden at that point. And sin will start growing on to you. And you'll start going down deeper into the ruts and into the fallacies of man. There you'll find yourself laying way down in there one day. Dying, dying, and even physical dying at times. You see, there was no cross in the life, necessarily in the tree of life, but yet it was. Because if you eat of the tree of life, you cannot eat of the other one. And that's the cross that I believe hits most people today and offends most people. We don't want just life. We want to know why life. We want to know profound life. We want to know, and so we can tell everybody about life. So that I can have it in Him. And I prayed something many years ago. I said to God, in the midst of all my, my life, I said, God, don't ever allow me to preach something that I have not experienced. Don't ever allow me to preach. And then in my prayer, I say, God, now bring me to that place. Just don't allow me. You bring me to that place, regardless of what you need to do in my life. You bring me to that place first. Only then can the true life come out of me that changes other people. And that's been my cry. There's some message to, messages to this day that I have never preached because I have not lived it. And I will not preach them. One of those is a message on meekness. I've not preached a message on meekness because I do not find it yet. See, humility is one thing. Meekness is another thing. A lot of people think meekness is humility. That's not what it is. But I don't want to turn to that now. Let's look at some other things here. Tree knowledge. Knowing all about the tree will not give you life. How many times have I seen people at the altar crying out, but I just don't understand it. You're trying to grab off of the tree of life, uh, knowledge. But I, I just cannot understand it. Once it's clear to me, then I can believe it. No. We believe it because it's the Word. And this is difficult. This is where the cross comes in. The cross of eating off of the tree of life is one that eats of it and not understands it. But the one that is eating off of the tree of knowledge has to understand it completely or he makes the word of God of non-effect and he throws it over here. I don't need that because I don't understand it. Concerning righteousness, uh, personal righteousness versus the righteousness of Christ, many people struggle with that because they don't understand it. 
The Bible never tells us that there is a place that you have to come to to understand it in order to receive it. No. This is why we receive by faith. You see, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. You, if you understand it, you probably don't need faith. This is why God allows these two trees now that we have, innocently yet perhaps not so because of Adam and Eve, that are constantly in our own life. And you can pull, to, uh, pull off of one or pull off of the other as you live. And many people, if they pull off of the one of the tree of knowledge, they'll never go far in their Christian life. And they will also conclude with things that, why is Jesus not working in my life? Why do I read the Bible and the things that are in the Bible are not coming from my life? And then so what we do is we lean harder on the tree of knowledge. Rather than taking up the cross, we lean harder on the tree of knowledge and we hang on to and we make ourselves do things. How many times have we looked at the fruit of the Spirit and we looked and we say, I need to have more love. God, I need to have more love. I'm just going to start loving more because the fruit. No, a fruit is a result. It's not something you make. It's not something you do. It's something that comes out of you because of a result. The fruit of the Spirit is a result. And so we don't try harder. We surrender our life and we eat off of the tree of life. That's where it comes. But it's so hard to do that because of what we go through in getting to that tree. You understand what I'm saying? Move on. James chapter 3 verse 14. But if any, but if ye have bitter envying and strive in your hearts, glory not. Lie not against the truth. This wisdom, the wisdom of knowing is Abel's producing. I want you to hear that. The wisdom or the knowledge of knowing stuns production. Because now you take it in your own hands to do. Where before you lean on God. Remember the Jacob story where Jacob was down in the dust. And until he was done with himself and he saw the enemy coming and full surrender. And finally he said, God, I'm going to die of a sentence on me. And Esau's coming over the hills. I'm going to die. Only then is when the fruit started. And only then is where God convinced Esau to be a friend to this man. In verse 15 it says, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly and sensual and devilish. In Lamentation chapter 3 verse 38 it says, Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good. Out of the mouth of the Most High, out of the mouth of God does not proceed good and evil. It's good and it's life. Remember that. Something that has always amused me a bit, not amused me, but I've wondered about this. I don't know trees as well as Mike would, some of you that are out here. So I, I look at the leaves and there I decide what the tree is. Some, some of them I understand by the bark as well. But I look at one tree and there's, there's one standing here and one standing here. And the same water basically feeds both. And they're standing on the same ground and drawing the same nutrients and minerals. And one comes up and produces apples and the other one comes up and produces cherries. I'm, I marvel at that at times. Look at this. Somewhere in the tree makes the difference. Somewhere in the tree, something happens and it turns into little red cherries and the other one, apples or peaches. And yet they draw from the same thing. It's a mystery. And yet we understand through science how it works. But it's still a mystery. And then I see this also in people's lives, feeding off the same word of God, receiving the same word of God, eating the same. And some turn out so different than others. What is the difference? I believe it is whether we have the tree of life in us or whether it's the tree of knowledge that we depend on. And listen, people, if I could just tell you this. You see, Apostle Paul, he was, he was educated with Gamaliel in the school that is even today known as a school of high regard even in Jerusalem. It's still known as one of the higher educated colleges. And it, still, it doesn't exist, but the things that they taught and so forth was far advanced above the others. And this is where Paul was taught. And I would like to say it's a bit of, a, bit of an issue between scholars between the age of 10 and 15. 
However, it would point almost that he was there at the age of 10, even more so than 15. And he already knew the Old Testament, much of it, and some of them believe he knew the whole Old Testament already by the age of 15. So Paul knew it all, but when God struck him down on the way to Damascus, and he struck him down with a powerful light from heaven, he said when, he, God, when God came down on him and he saw the calling on his life, and God released him. He said, immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Immediately, I did not depend on knowledge. But he turned to the revelation of Christ by way of a true experience with him. And in that submission and, and that true experience that he experienced in Christ, as he surrendered his life to him on daily basis, even in prison as he wrote much of this Bible, New Testament, as he was in prison at times, when he was writing these things, it wasn't the pleasant things, but look what came out of him. So you see, he knew him by revelation, not by knowledge. He knew it because of being in him, not of him. There's a big difference. If you're frustrated in your Christian life, I will tell you this, my friend. If you're frustrated in your Christian life because you see of what all is going on within you that perhaps you would not dare to even talk about besides maybe just me and a few others. Or even maybe, not even me, but other frustrating things. It must be, my friend, only then that you're eating off of the tree of life. You might know it all. You might know it so well. You might understand it so well, but it's not in you. It must be an awful frustration it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I see this principle. Eve and Adam, the two beginning children of all mankind, they looked at that tree and they said, that's an easy one, let's eat this one. And then we can be smart, we can know everything, and we can do everything. Yes, we're going to die, but so what? Do you think that's a little bit the way they looked? No, I believe they were completely deceived. They were deceived, especially Eve. She was deceived by the serpent because the serpent had a powerful voice. You know why? Because she saw the serpent, obviously. But where was God? He was not seen. He was a voice. And that voice spoke. But Eve wanted to see something. She wanted to learn something for, that she could see, something that she could touch, something that she could taste, something that she could have. And that's so much the carnal man. That's so much the way it is in our life. We want to believe something that we can touch. We want to believe something that is easy, visible. But something that takes faith, oh, it's so hard. Because there's a cross in faith. This is why many people do not walk in faith, do not like faith, do not understand faith. Romans chapter 7. The tree of knowledge. Let me, under, let me, uh, let me say it this way. Tree knowledge is a bad tree. And here is the perfectly displayed tree of knowledge. Romans 7, 19. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would, that I do. Now if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. There's the tree of knowledge. If this is your life, you've been eating off the tree of knowledge. You've been pushing away from the cross. You've been longing to go another direction without paying the final dues of self. Interesting as I find that this past week I was pre uh, speaking to a man from another area. And he was, uh, uh, he was actually from the state here, but from another area. And I was speaking to him and I was referring to Romans seven nineteen, And I just read some of these verses off. And before I was done, he said, well, that's just the way I find it for me. And he happened to be a preacher. Listen, my friend, if this is what you're going through, the things that you want to do are the things that you can't do. And the things that you can't do or the things that you don't want to do are the things that you're doing. You're living under the bondage of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what's happening. Now, I will choose to go further before I speak more about that. 
And uh, in fact, we'll probably talk some about that at the Romans teaching on Tuesday evening. We want to go back to the garden and, again and look at something like this. Satan had a power grab and he stole all that, that God-given authority that mankind had. And in that, I would like to look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now this word air, now this this understanding of this word, word air is not original with me. This is something I heard from Derek Prince some years ago. He said this word air interprets the level of oxygen that is around the earth. He, he knew Greek and Hebrew fluently. He said it in, interprets that as being the air where life lives in and is sustained in. Here it says that Adam and Eve were given the dominion to have authority over everything that flies as high as what they could breathe and also lives in the ground where they could breathe. Now we notice uh, very quickly after that, I guess quickly, I'm in my notes, quickly after that I should say, but it was many, many years later, where Daniel was praying and he was seeking the face of God and he could not get answers because he had a dream and a vision and he didn't know what to do. And even the people that were around him when he had it, they started shaking and finally they walked off. Because God, he, Daniel was praying and crying to God for help and somehow to interpret what he just saw. And in this scene, all at once, something spoke to him and it was an angel. And he said that, uh, from the day that you cried to me and the day that you start calling on my name for interpretation of this dream or what this means, I heard you. But he said, for 21 days, I was resisted somewhere in the upper atmosphere somewhere of the king of Persia that stood against me and locked me up that I could not come through to you. And I, I see here that what Adam and Eve had dominion over, now somebody else, the king of Persia, had dominion over it. The king of Persia had power and had authority over this area, this realm. And was controlling it even to the point where God's holy angel could not come right down through. For 21 days. Somewhere there was an exchange. I had a long list of what I wanted to speak about that. Listen, my friends, if I can tell you one thing. Sometimes, if you have an issue in your marriage, if you have an issue in your home, if you have an issue somewhere else with somebody else, I have numerous times God has shown me this truth. When somebody stands against me, perhaps, and I know that that's somebody that loves God. I just instructed this reasonably to some, uh, reason, uh, uh, just recently to somebody. Somebody that was complaining, not from here, not from around here, was complaining, or not really complaining, but sharing concern that I'm being withstood. And I said, and I just told him, they're not your enemy. Listen, your wife is not your enemy. Your husband's not your enemy. Your child is not your enemy. Your neighbor is not your enemy. Your brother and sister is not your enemy. You know who your enemy is? It's the prince of the power of the air. And if people walk in their flesh and eat off of the knowledge, the tree of knowledge, that power of the air will have influence on them and they can throw out some things that you'll feel. This is where the first thing we do when we sense this is we deal with those powers the way Jesus dealt with them. So many times have I heard down through my life that so-and-so said something about me, so-and-so. If that is an issue to you, go on your knees and deal with it. The one that has higher power than that individual does. Deal with it there. Take him before the throne of God and cry out to him and tell God and ask God and beg God to take that power of that enemy and to, so that that power of the enemy would have no more influence on that person. And you will see miracles. If we could only see that. But the tree of knowledge will not allow us to see that. You see that comes in Revelation. By walking with Jesus, we know that's how he dealt with. Do you notice that when Jesus healed people, a lot of times he even cast out devils. He always 
somehow ended up dealing with the enemy. You notice that? He dealt with the enemy. And we say, how is this? Because he knew what we do not see. He could then see, I believe, what we do not even know. And this is how we work. When you go into, let, let me say this, my prayers of coming to this service this morning, that I knew that what God wants to do in some of your lives, nobody specifically, but just what God wants to do, what I sense coming from heaven in my heart, that God wants to divide the soul from the flesh man. And in order to do that, he has somehow, there's, there's a heavenly accompaniment up here somehow that is, has brought a lot of influence on people, that has put strongholds around people, and those strongholds are broken in the power of Jesus. And when we believe that, and we, we realize that, and we speak against that in the name of Jesus, and we surrender ourselves under the power of God, they have no control. They have no charge over you. Whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your home, wherever it is. I even say your business and everything. The enemy always wants to infiltrate somehow into, in, and then bring influences. And he'll bring the influences through people that walk in the flesh. People that walk in the flesh, remember, have eaten off, have eaten off the tree of knowledge. They have serpent seed in them. The other ones have eternal life in them. Never ever be used as serpent seed. Never ever allow the serpent, the accuser of the brethren, to speak out of you. Never ever. Ephesians 2, verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power, and here comes the same word, air. Describe the same air. The prince of the power of the air. You see the enemy, Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air. And if you let down your guards, if you're going through a hard time, my friend, here's one way you can judge yourself. If you go into a hard time, it will either break you, or it'll make you bitter. If it makes you bitter, you've been eating off the wrong tree. If it breaks you, you've been eating off the tree of life. And I always judge that in my life, that when something happens in my life, when I have a, a personal defeat or something just in my own life, in my own heart, that's not going the way I know God wants it to go. And I always judge the barometer of my heart. Did that break you or did that make you bitter? Did that make you mad? If it made you mad, if it made you bitter, if it put unforgiveness in you, then you know it's a tree of knowledge that you've been eating of. But the man that is spiritual will always be broken. And in that brokenness, he will be cleansed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, the life of God flows out of you. That's how it works. Have you ever noticed that people that are broken have so much more to give? You often notice that people have gone through a lot of deep things. There's something about it. There's just something about them you sense breaking. Verse 3, among whom also we had our conversation in the times past. In the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. That is the exact same description of what the world is. It says that in the times past, we have a lot of people that warn about world, world, world. Here it is. And the Bible says, if you're a friend to it, you're an enemy to God. This is why. Because our past conversation in times past was based on lusts of the flesh, fulfilling, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And these were by nature children of wrath, even as others. That's who we were. But God has saved us out of that. The exchange is done at the tree. Man's dominion versus Satan's dominion. I would like to, if I could, and I... I'm not sure how I'll do this. Explain to you what the carnal man is and the spiritual man. I, I think I should have a, two hours to talk about this. But in short, how could God somehow speak through me to show to you what the spiritual man is and what the carnal man is? And furthermore, to deal that in your life. You see, when we look at this, 
How should I do this? I think, let me, uh, let me go back and look at the tree again, and then we'll go to Hebrews, and then we'll talk about it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes, there's nothing wrong with that. Remember that? There was nothing wrong with that because they were all that way. Bible is very clear that all the trees looked like that. But now here's another thing. And a tree desired to make one wise. This is the mistake. It's when Adam, where Eve saw that actually if I eat of this tree, I'm going to become as God. I'm going to become wise because who said it? Satan did. Did Satan lie about it? No, that was not a lie in itself. It is very obvious because that's exactly what God confessed later on. He said, now they are like gods. And lest they eat of the tree of life, you understand what I'm saying. So it says, and she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband, unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Man wanted to get it all by touching and eating. Wouldn't that be the easy way? How many times have I seen people wishing in their heart that somebody would pray for them and just lay their hand on them? And I do that, but lay their hand on them, and then I would be healed. We like to be touched and have our remedy. We like to taste and have our remedy. But God says it's through life that we get the remedy. It's through eternal life. It's the tree of life, but it costs. It costs. You can just not naturally eat off of that tree. You have to become a spiritual man to eat of that tree. Now, within ourselves is these two trees. It's found there in, in Romans chapter 7. Relationship is knowing, fellowship, attachment, participation, receiving, and giving. That's what it means. You see, when we eat off of the tree of life, we establish a relationship with him. And that relationship is this one. That when I fail, he is there. He picks me up. But off the tree of the knowledge, if I fail, I lay there. And I like to hit myself. I don't like others to hit me yet. To make me feel really rotten and really bad. So that the punishment that I take, I can walk away from. At least I paid for it. That's the tree of knowledge. The relationship, the tree of life is one of relationship. It is one that not all the time, not, not everything goes so well all the time. It's not where a man is always walking way up there. It's a place where man and woman make failures. But it's the place where God picks you up because you have nobody else to pick you up. You can't pick yourself up. It's a place of surrender. It's a place of walking. And then God instills his life even further. Every time he takes his hand upon you and pulls you up, you have more life. But if you're one of these, I can do it and I will. And I'm going to show them. I tell you what, my friend, you're going to go right down into a spiral and you're going to lose. And for this, so many people, they wrestle with the tree of knowledge and then the tree of life. And one time we eat a little bit of a bite of life, and then we take a life, um, and it's, that's what the Bible says. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walking in the Spirit is eating of the tree of life. It is on the floor. It is on your face. It is not being a strong, mighty man. No, it's not. Only if God holds you that way. But it's a surrendered life. It's a relationship life. It's something that God knows you very well. He knows you because he's helped you up many times. And he will continue to do that until you're gone. That's the tree of life life. Many people think that's not life. That's your life. You know the other life? Is you're going to brace yourself up and you're going to try harder and you're going to try harder and you'll be a failure. Which one is life? Tell me. We want the, the perfect life. That's what he's working on. He'll perfect us in that. It's the difference. Understanding and walking in this life. You hear many comments that people make. And you say, oh, well. She didn't know what she said there. He didn't know what he said there. Oh. This is why some people have accused me already in the past. You can see right through people. I can't see through people. But I can hear what you're saying. And I know, this, I know the source of what people talk out of. 
I used to say this, that when I see a preacher that preaches with his fist, we need to serve God. This man's ability trying to do it. We have no fist in our life. Our lives are surrendered in the presence of God. We live the surrendered life because it's the tree of life. It's the way it works. What I'm trying to tell you, my friend, is it's the way it works. Now, some, some of you might say like this, well, is there ever a place where I can come off where I am because I make a lot of mistakes, I make a lot of failures? That's right. There is a place. You know what it's called? Heaven. I know of about two people that got there because they lived so perfect without dying. His name is Enoch and his name is Elijah. The rest, as far as I know, all had to die because they never came to that point. Once you come to that point where you make no more failures, where you are completely perfect, God will then, okay, just come then. I can see that. Do we give, a, do, do we give ourselves license to be failures? No. We never do that. And you don't either. That's the good thing. There's, how many times have I told people as they were uh, dealing with issues in their life and they say, you know, I just, I just had a failure in my life. I just made a real bad boo-boo in my life and I feel so bad about it. I feel so sorry about it. I'm not sure what to do. And I said, well, what do you want? Well, uh, I want to come to a place where I don't do this again. I said, do you want to do it? No. Well, that tells me you're on the other side of the fence. You see, when you, when you trust, when you say like this, no, I want to do it, then you're on the wrong side of the fence. That tells me your desire is to do right. Your desire is to do good. It tells, gives me a lot of courage. When I see in my life that I commit a sin or do something and I justify it, that's where there's a problem. The tree of life is so full of life, there's always a division and enmity between you and the other one. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. Here it is. Let us labor, therefore. If you want to work, here it is. Work, labor, to enter into that rest, lest any man should fall short of the example of unbelief. Verse 12. And here is the key that many people just don't quite understand by way of experience. For the word of God is quick. It is powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and, the joints and, and of the joints and maron is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God says like this here in, in Hebrews. It says that, I have people asking me this. How do I know whether I'm walking in the spiritual or whether I'm walking carnal? It's based on right here. This is where it happens. How many times have you and I come to the word of God and we come to a place or perhaps a conviction or something in our, in our life that was a deep conviction and we said, no. That was the carnal man turning away from it. Or we said, yes, I surrender. At that point of surrender is when the knife of God cuts you right down through the heart, and that's where the spiritual man comes out of. That's exactly how it works. How do I know when I'm spiritual? It's the word of God that makes you spiritual. It's the cutting, the two-edged sword, and that's the two-edged sword that was in the Garden of Eden after they ate of the tree of knowledge, stood there protected with the cherubims. Cherubims were standing on the east side of the garden and protected the way of the tree of life. So nobody could have free access to it and just go get it because of sin. Because there had to be a substitutionary sacrifice first, which was Jesus Christ on the cross. And it's now through that cross that we can have access. How is it done? What is Jesus? He is the Word. The Bible says He is the way, truth, and life. And He is the Word of life. He is the Word. And that Word is the two-edged sword. So when that two-edged sword pierces you, at a time you don't really, I don't want to, I don't want to give up. I, I want my way in this. I'm going to show God that I can. No, I cannot. I surrender to God because I can't. It's that surrender is where the knife just cuts you. That's the spiritual man. And then that man alone can be empowered by the Holy Spirit. The spiritual man is not this one. It's this one. Not by actions the way I'm doing it, but by experience. It's the man that says, God, you're right. God, I'm weak. And in my weakness, it's, see, I see this. Paul said that I delight to be weak. I love to be weak because when I'm weak, 
God does things. And I can't go like this, that it was me. Other things that I think maybe it was me that did it, I really did this, I really said that. No, I really did that. How many times have you walked away from something and you said, huh, that was me? My friend, you're a carnal man. The Bible says, I can do nothing outside God. Jesus said he found that in his life. He couldn't do a thing outside God. And if Jesus couldn't, how less can we? We only do everything through the strength that God gives us. And so we contribute everything to his strength. All the things that I do and all the things I have done is by his strength. All the things you can do and have done is by his strength. And we need to regard it as that, lest it be taken away from us. Amen? Amen. The spiritual man will be the man that will allow the cutting knife of God. Oh, God, I'm wrong. God, I repent. God, I'm sorry. Lord, help me. Help me, Lord. Help me. I'm undone. It's not, okay, I'm going to show them. No, that's the carnal man. And if you walk that way, you're going to have a lot of lusts. Another thing the Bible says, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you know you're not walking in the spirit. Then you're doing something wrong. You know what that is? You are not coming to the tree of life and eating of it by way of the cross. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. You know that before I come to this pulpit this morning, I was on my face. I, know, I, I normally don't let you in on some of this, but when Kevin put this on me, I said, don't you have anything you want to preach? I am so empty. I have so nothing. I, have, I am so inside out. It just seems that there's nothing, nothing, nothing. And I travailed and travailed and travailed and travailed. And it just seemed that it was just locked up. There was just nothing, nothing, nothing. A little bit like Steve, I believe, experienced it last Sunday. You know what Paul said? When I see that nothing, then he says, then I take courage. He said, because when I'm weak, then he has to stand in my place. And that's the life that we desire. But when we walk in it, it seems so, it seems so difficult. But this is where faith comes. And so we open our mouth, and then he'll fill it. We go forward, and then he'll step ahead of us. We will surrender, and he'll pick us up. We will sin, and he will forgive us. We get hurt, and he will heal us. All this is in the tree of life, not in the tree of knowledge. And in the, in the day that we live in today, we have all kinds of ideas how we can heal somebody within the inner spiritual man, the inner, inner healing and all that. You need to do all this in 10 steps, 25 steps. When, when Jesus comes on, this, on the scene, you just touch his garment, you're healed. And he still does that today. A couple more things and I want to stop and we want to pray for those that need healed. Genesis chapter 3 verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed him in the east of the garden of Eden. Cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to him to keep the way of the tree of life. Galatians chapter 4 verse 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that is born after the spirit. Have you ever noticed that? People that are spiritual, the spiritual minded, if I can say it this way, Norma, the spiritual minded, those that walk in the spirit are always the ones that are accused. They're always the ones that are pushed. They're always the ones that are faults found in them. And many times they have faults. That's fine. That's one way that God perfects us. He shows us our faults. And sometimes he shows us our faults through our enemies because he wants to see us how we respond. You see, God is not concerned of who it comes through. He's just concerned that it changes a person. And when you're a spiritual man, the enemy can accuse you. It will not hurt you. Look at Jesus when Peter said, Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. Jesus didn't curl up and say that, oh my, now I'm so discouraged. Somebody discouraged me from going further. No, he did not do that. 
That's the protection that we find in the cross. The spiritual man is completely protected because you know what he does when he gets wounded? He falls on his face and then he is healed. He says, God, I, this hurts so bad. And God says, well, by the time you're going to get up, it's not going to hurt anymore because you'll give your life as a sacrifice. We give our lives to be hurt if that's what it is. In Iran, in some of those places, in Pakistan, we don't know what hurt is. It might be them coming in through the doors and throwing us in prison away from our, our children and wives. And we might be in there as some of them are right as I speak. They're in prisons. Perhaps some of them will even hear this very message of their husband sitting in prison because they will, not, they will refuse to acknowledge that Jesus is not God. Because many of them are asked to say, if you say that Jesus is not God, we'll let you go. And they'll refuse to do that. They stand on the power of God. There might be people like that. And here we just have these little words that come our way once in a while. If somebody says something bad, a bad story circles in the community, that's fine. God, what is in it for me? If nothing else, it's to keep me on my face, to keep me face down so that his spiritual life would work in me, so that he can perfect me in the areas that there might be some truth in. Amen? God takes... That which Satan throws at you and he paints the picture and he'll make something more beautiful out of it. It must be the most frustrating thing of the enemy because he keeps shooting things and saying things and doing things, trying to discourage a person and he just dies. What can I do? Kick him around and I'll kick him around. But what will he do? He will not die. He'll just surrender. And then the power of God comes in him and they walk around and they're healed. It must be the most frustrating thing for the enemy to try to take down a man of God or a woman of God because they just surrender at the cry of God and then they're healed. It's the difference between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge. The tree of the knowledge is, oh, I heard what they, oh, this is really, oh, my. I, um, telephone. Uh, did you hear the story? That was not me. It's not me. They got the story wrong. Got the story wrong. You're going to be hurt. You fall on your face before God and say, God, even if they kill me, then let it be so. But I know what's true in here. And what's weak in me, Lord, fix. And every time I die like that, he fixes something that when he get up, it's fixed. It's healed. We don't need to walk around. Friend, we don't need to walk around with years of hurts and pains. I was abused as a young child. Yes, I was, by several men. It's never had an effect on me. After I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, I was healed. Now, I say never, it was before that. But after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was healed. You died to that. We deserve the worst. We deserve to die because of what we did in the garden. And so all the L's is a free gift. If somebody has a critical eye about you, die to it. Let them speak a thousand words against you. If you die, they can't do anything. You can't go any deader than die. Yeah, amen. amen. Right. Die, surrender, lay it down. We're here as ambassadors of Christ. Now, when Christ says something, it's a different story. And my sheep know my voice. This is how we perfect in the image of Christ. God wants to know. Sometimes he takes somebody. I remember at one time earlier in my life, somebody sat me down and they just went from my head to my toes. I mean, they found every little thing they could find. And I sat there and I could think of <laughs> so many things about that person, just the attitude he was talking about. But you know what? About every so often he had some. He was right. He was right. So what do I do with it? It was all the devil? No. God spoke to me. Sometimes he will speak to you. Other times the devil will speak to you. But if you surrender, it won't hurt you. What did Adam and Eve do? They ate of the tree. Did it hurt them? Absolutely. They didn't surrender. They just listened to what the enemy said. Galatians chapter 4, verse 29. But as then... He that was born after the flesh. Oh, I just read that. Sorry about that. But what I'm, yeah. Let, let, let me just speak a little bit about this yet. 
But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so, it's all about Esau and Isaac. Remember one thing, that if you are a spiritual person, you will always have people accusing you because the natural man will always be in conflict with the spiritual man. It's just the way it works. The ma and the spiritual man should never be sit here and say that, I don't know why, they, why this just happens. It just, I'm always the one that gets criticized. That's all right. It, it's, if it's from the carnal man, it's the way it happens. Because the carnal man thinks different. The carnal man can't even receive the things of God. The carnal man, my friend, is not the non-Christian. It can be, but it's not the non-Christian. The carnal man is the man that refuses the cross. He refuses the life of the cross. He's a man that walks under soul power. He's a man that walks under the, the power of his emotions, his will, and his intellect. He's a man that is empowered by that source which comes right off the tree of the knowledge, good and evil. And the spiritual man is not even thinking those things. And so the, the natural man goes by the things he sees and hears. Jesus said, when it was said about him coming, he said, there are some things that I will not do. One thing I will not do, in a prophetic word, he said that when I come, I will not go by what I see, and I will not go by what I hear. If Jesus would have gone by what he saw, he couldn't have healed Lazarus because he would have seen him dead. But right on that... God did not tell him he's dead, and therefore, when they asked him, he said, he's sleeping. You see, many times, we want to go by what we see and say, oh, that's impossible. Okay, it'll be impossible. But when you wait and you have your judgment the way God says, you see what I'm saying? What is God saying about this? It looks impossible to my natural eyes, but I will refuse to see Smith Wigglesworth made that statement. He said, I refuse to, see, to believe what I see with my eyes. Look at the su success he had concerning faith. And if you refuse to hear what you hear with your ears concerning people, you will save yourself. Jesus said, he will not go by those two things. John 14, two more verses. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in uh, John eleven twenty five, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believeth in me, though, were, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me sh uh, shall never die, believest thou this. And remember, believeth in me, in me, not of me, in me. Believeth in me. How many of us believe in Christ? We say, I believe in Jesus. No. Believe in Christ. When Jesus was at the cross, I was in him. This is why it says in Corinthians that if, one, if, if, if Christ died for all, then all were dead. We were in Christ and we were at the cross in the eyes of God. God looks at we, the punishment was paid in Christ and therefore everybody has died. Yes, That's what he says. Yes. That's a wonderful truth. Because if I died with Christ, where it says in Colossians, so if I died with him, I will also resurrect with him. So that means if I died with him, I rose with him. So what's my problem? This is the glorious, glorious life of Jesus Christ. And for time's sake, I will stop.